Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Ishan Gera and here are the stories for the day. The government has come out with draft rules for online gaming. While releasing it, the Minister of State for IT, Rajiv Chandrasekhar, said that the online gaming sector has the potential to grow a $200 billion industry. And not just the minister's statement, the draft too had some good news for the sector. One of them was setting up an industry-led self-regulatory body to check online gambling and other issues. So will the self-regulation model work for this industry? given the many challenges associated with it? Bhaswar Kumar brings you the answer. You may be a cricket fanatic who wants the IPL madness to continue through the year. So, you get on to Dream 11, an online game where you create your own cricket team of real players for an upcoming match and compete with others for prizes. Or maybe you want to play Rummy against the best. Either way, you belong to the 507 million strong cohort of online gamers that India has. While this tribe continues to grow, the industry has come under considerable scrutiny amid multiple reports of people ending their lives after losing money on online gaming. As a result, state governments and the centre have stepped up efforts at regulation, which may finally be taking shape. On the 2nd of January, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology proposed an amendment to bring online gaming under the ambit of the Information Technology Intermediary Guidelines and Digital Media Ethics Code Rules 2021. Under the proposal, which is part of the draft online gaming policy that will be subject to public consultation, all online games would be required to register with a self-regulatory body approved by the Ministry. Such a model would be similar to the regulations that exist for digital news sites and streaming services under the IT rules. The IT Ministry has been appointed as the Nodal Ministry for Online Gaming. The self-regulatory body will also certify what is permitted as an online game in India. Which games are permissible and which are not has become a debatable question in the past few years, especially how games of skill are to be distinguished from games of chance, if at all. These are the two broad categories into which online games are divided. In a game of skill, success depends on the player's superior knowledge, training and experience. In a game of chance, the outcome depends principally on luck. In particular, this classification problem has plagued real money games, where real money is wagered on the outcome of the game, including those of skill. A game of chance is considered gambling. Valued at $2.6 billion in FY22, India's gaming market is expected to grow fourfold by 2027 to $8.6 billion. India also became the world's largest consumer of mobile games in FY22 in terms of total downloads. According to the All India Gaming Federation, the online gaming sector has provided 100,000 jobs directly. Given these numbers, the need for regulation has become all the more essential. The online gaming industry has lauded the proposed amendments, which include age verification of players, a know-your-customer process, a grievance redressal mechanism, and online gaming companies having a physical Indian address. Coming back to the proposed self-regulatory body, it will have to ensure that the registered games do not contain anything that can impact the sovereignty, integrity, and defense of the country, its relations with foreign states, and public order. The games must be in conformity with the laws of the land, including regulations related to gambling and betting. The body will provide membership to online gaming intermediaries, which will observe due diligence required under the rules, just like IT intermediaries. Such a model is in line with the expectations of the industry, which had earlier opposed the creation of any statutory body, like an online gaming commission, for oversight. But self-regulation for online gaming also has its share of detractors. At present, online gaming platforms in India already have some degree of self-regulation. For example, charters established by different associations ensure that signatories operate only games of skill for money. But the lack of uniformity in the industry and its size pose considerable challenges. 
Beyond the broad categories of games of chance and skill, there are other subdivisions within the industry, such as real money games, casual games and fantasy sports. While we have already explained real money games, in fantasy games, players build make-believe teams of real players of a given sport. There are reportedly more than 900 online gaming companies in India. The All India Gaming Federation, one of the country's largest industry bodies for online gaming, has only around 10% of the industry as its members, and only an estimated 15% of the industry adheres to self-regulation and best practices. Different bodies, such as the All India Gaming Federation, the Federation of Fantasy Sports, and the E-Gaming Federation will also need to be on the same page for self-regulation to work. India has also seen questionable enforcement by self-regulatory organizations. For example, the FIKI survey on advertising standards showed that the Advertising Standards Council of India, a voluntary self-regulation council, has been unable to regulate effectively. Against this backdrop, we reached out to industry and legal experts to understand whether a self-regulation model could work for online gaming in India. So in terms of self-regulation for online gaming industry, I think uh it's a little premature to say that that would be a big success. Um, in my opinion, it is going to be a, a very difficult situation because there are vested interests involved. So if you're going to have the industry regulate itself, uh, they could be more liberal in terms of their own uh, um, regulatory action um, or uh, penal action. And also there are chances that uh, it could lead to cartelization because uh, the self-regulatory authority would consist of some of the bigger players, while smaller players may not get a, that big a chance to sort of uh, uh, put their point across. Once online gaming comes under the Ministry of IT, then it is the Ministry of IT or the, the IT rules that are going to have precedence. And you would have a self-regulatory organization also trying to regulate the industry. So you would have a situation where there could be a conflict between the two uh, bodies. I think that, you know, uh, the self-regulatory mechanism will succeed. We've been already doing this for the last uh, seven years. So for us, we see, you know, the uh, rules specifying that uh, gaming businesses uh, should be registered with an SRO and that model as an extension to all, what we are already doing. Uh, specifically under the uh, AGs of the self-regulatory organization in our case, you know, the, the skill, All India Skill Games Council. We already have that structure in place and, you know, that mechanism is working successfully. Regulatory clarity is also awaited on one key issue. On the 2nd of January, the Union Minister of State for Electronics and Information Technology, Rajiv Chandrasekhar, said that any game which allows or permits wagering on its outcome is effectively a no-go area. He said that if a game allows a player to bet on its outcome, then it is prohibited. There were apprehensions that there may be confusion about whether or not games that have been recognized by courts as games of skill will be able to continue operating under this policy. Our understanding is that the rules clearly do not you know, encourage the offering of gambling services. Yeah and require online games to comply with existing laws regarding betting and gambling, which, as you know, you know, uh, lies with the state. Uh, so games of skill which do not, uh, do not contravene the gambling, betting and gambling laws of the country will be allowed. Some experts believe as the online gaming industry grows, there will be a point when questions of national and financial security could get involved. Despite the recent regulatory steps, tensions between the centre and states may emerge in the future, since it is the latter that often have to deal with the socio-economic impact of online games. Being able to navigate these future challenges may turn out to be the self-regulation model's real test. This draft in all likelihood will be the first step by the government to regulate the online gaming sector.
Meanwhile, the country is also seeing a jump in the number of electric vehicles. But despite last year's record sales, its penetration is still very low. Of the total automobile sales, EVs accounted for less than 5% in 2022. So what will it take for the EV ecosystem to be as big as that of internal combustion engine market? Will commercial EVs lead the way? How is the adoption of more commercial electric vehicles changing the EV landscape? Tariq Ahmed brings you the answer. The number of electric vehicles sold last year broke all the previous records. The EV industry touched the milestone of 1 million unit sales in calendar year 2022. Of the total electric vehicle sales, two-wheelers grabbed the largest pie at 62% and the share of three-wheelers was 32%. The government has set an ambitious target for EVs to make up 30% of private cars, 70% of commercial vehicles and 80% of two and three-wheelers by 2030. But at 4.7%, the penetration of EVs is still low. Lack of a proper ecosystem, which includes the easy availability of charging ports, is one of the main reasons. So will commercial vehicles help clear the way and put the ecosystem in place? Experts believe they may hold the key. But how is the adoption of commercial EVs progressing? E-commerce and food delivery companies have been adopting electric vehicles for the last mile connectivity in their delivery fleets. The Delhi government too has also made it mandatory for the delivery aggregators to adopt electric vehicles in their new fleets. If we were to look at uh, the trucks, uh, we have to also segment it into say, uh, you know, uh, the small trucks uh, or the light trucks. You may still see some uptick in these. Uh, and again, and sort of, uh, well, those commercial vehicles, say the three-wheeler tempos, uh, are also seeing a huge uptick. And this is largely driven by e-commerce companies, you know. Uh, so uh, you will see some transition in this space till the one-tonners, okay, or sub-one-tonners. And this is largely being driven by e-commerce companies because, uh, you know, you have a lot of delivery to make, uh, intra-city deliveries. Recently, Ola Electric co-founder Bhavi Shagarwal announced that Ola will soon start manufacturing commercial EVs along with electric cars and two-wheelers. This move, along with Ola's plans to produce its own lithium-ion batteries, are one of the biggest initiatives in the EV sector in the coming years. Also, the Jupiter Electric Mobility, the company that is famous for making train coaches and railway equipment, is debuting into the commercial EV industry by launching light commercial vehicles in India in 2023. Union Transport Minister Nitin Gadkari has set a target of EV sales penetration of 70% of commercial vehicles by 2030. But is it feasible? A joint report by the Automotive Component Manufacturers Association of India and McKinsey says that only 10 to 15 percent of the passenger vehicles will be electric by 2030. The same report projects that by 2030, 60 percent of two-wheelers and 85 percent of three-wheelers will be electric. But for the four-wheelers, the report projects 10 percent penetration and 5 percent for heavy commercial vehicles. In the phase two of Fame India scheme, the government has allotted 10,000 crore rupees for a period of three years commencing from 1st April 2019. Out of the total fund, about 86% has been allotted for demand initiative. This phase aims to generate demand by supporting 7,000 e-buses, 5 lakh e-3-wheelers, 55,000 e-4-wheeler passenger cars, including strong hybrid and 10 lakh e-2-wheelers. Also, in order to reduce the prices of electric vehicles, it is important to manufacture automobile components and batteries. Towards this, the government has allotted 25,938 crore rupees under the production-linked incentive scheme in 2021. Adding to that, the government has reduced the GST for the electric vehicles from 12% to 5% and also the tax rate of chargers and charging stations have been reduced from 18% to 5%. To bring down the initial cost of new electric vehicles, the central government has suggested state governments to exempt road taxes of EVs. India currently has 5,151 public charging stations, and this number is expected to increase 
to 1 lakh units by 2027. The country requires some 20.5 lakh charging stations by 2030 to operate the projected electric vehicle penetration across different categories of vehicles. One of the other major aspects that may hamper the EV penetration in India is the country's dependency on imports for the raw materials needed to manufacture lithium-ion batteries. Majority of the cost of an EV comes from the battery packs. Uh, some companies are uh, uh, using uh, different kind of chemistries to mitigate that problem to bring the cost down, whereas increasing the energy efficiency, the energy density, so that more energy can be packed within the same amount of batteries that they are installing. But that's the major challenge that I feel is with the uh, four, uh, four wheelers and the uh, commercial vehicles. Since more and more commercial vehicles are turning green, it is highly likely that the EV ecosystem in the country will get a leg up in the coming years to cater to the growing need. Electric vehicles will be contributing towards India's target to be carbon neutral by 2070. It is estimated that 156 million tons of carbon emission can be avoided if India were able to achieve the target set for 2030. Moving on to the markets, the IT sector which remains at the center of a global slowdown and a likely impending recession in the West is set to kickstart the third quarter earnings next week. As the global growth outlook continues to weaken, will the sector manage to hold its ground or will it succumb to global headwinds? Harshita Singh brings us the answers in our next report. The IT sector that had managed to perform better than expected in the July to September quarter is now gearing up for the seasonally weak second half of the fiscal. IT major TCS will kick off the Q3 corporate earnings next Monday, followed by Infosys, HCL Tech and Wipro later in the week. In Q3, analysts expect demand to have been firm but revenue is likely to have moderated amid a deteriorating global macro environment. We expect IT industry to demonstrate resilience in terms of demand. Uh, in Q3 FY23, despite of having uh, uncertainties from the global economies and also uh, Q3 is considered to be a seasonally weak quarter. We can expect uh, the revenue growth momentum at 2.5 to 5% in CC terms uh, in Q3 FY23 on Q on Q basis. Uh, we can expect some moderation in the revenue growth momentum and also in the deal wins in Q3 FY23 due to uncertainties. We expect Infosys to outperform in uh, uh, in Q3 FY23 on the large cap side with a uh, Q on Q growth of 4% on in CC terms. Uh, uh, in in mid cap part, we expect persistent to surpass the growth uh, with, uh, with as compared to all its peers. Meanwhile, Kotak Institutional Equities has pegged the sector's sequential revenue growth even lower at 0 to 3% in constant currency. According to Kotak Institutional Equities, revenue growth will moderate to high single digits to low teens on a YOY basis. EBIT margin has bottomed out and will likely improve, albeit moderately. The brokerage expects HCL Tech and LTI Mindtree to lead the pack with sequential growth of 3% each, followed by TCS at 1.9%. Wipro and Infosys are expected to report a 1% growth while Tech Mahindra and Emphasis may end up with flat revenues. Besides, the street will closely look out for cues from management on demand slowdown and possible client budget cuts. On the cost front, we are expecting some moderation in the employee cost as well as some cooling off in attrition level. In addition to this, weakening of Ruby will also aid in margin improvement. Further, we expect the tone of the management commentary to be positive for Q4 FY23 and Q1 FY24. However, they may cite some challenges in the near term. Further, management comments regarding the sector outlook as well as outlook regards to company's revenue, cost and order book will be the key factor to watch in for Q3. At the bosses, Tech Mahindra, Wipro and Emphasis are the top IT losers having slumped to 32-42% to over the last 9 months as compared to 4% gain in the Nifty 50. 
Analysts at Investec Capital Services believe that revenue weakness in the second half of FY23 and a tepid start to FY24 could remain key risks for IT stocks. This could reduce Tier 1 growth expectations to 6-7% to versus 8% currently, leading to likely contraction in PE multiples, they say. That said, equity markets will track domestic services PMI data today along with the recent meeting minutes of the US Fed. After the markets, let us shift to the higher education segment, which will see two big developments this year. The country's first digital university will become operational soon, and the Higher Education Commission of India will also come up. Today, we offer insight into the upcoming digital university. How will it work, and how will it benefit students and professionals? Let us find out. Union Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman had announced the National Digital University in her 2022-23 budget speech. Minister of State for Education Rajkumar Ranjan Singh later told the Rajya Sabha that the government will provide world-class quality universal education with personalized learning experience at doorsteps through this digital university. The National Digital University will bring participating universities or higher education institutions together on one platform and in a standardized credit system called Academic Bank of Credit, ABC. In the National Education Policy 2020, the government had proposed to create a digital infrastructure that will store the academic credits earned by the students of various higher education institutes. Students are required to get at least 50% of total degree credits from one institute to get a degree from there. So if you choose an online course from Presidency College and earn 50% of the credits, then you will be awarded a degree by that institution. One of the key features of this online university will be that it will allow students to choose multiple courses from different institutes and design their own program. The Academic Bank of Credit in the Digital University will allow students to enter into a university, get 50% of the necessary credits and move to another university for the rest of the credits to complete the course. Students can enroll into different courses from different participating institutions and earn a certificate from National Digital University when the required credits are met. The Digital University will improve employability by letting people take emerging courses that are in demand and the government hopes to attain 50% of gross enrollment rate by 2030 through this initiative. National Digital University acts as an aggregator of the courses provided by the participating universities. These courses can be accessed through a digital platform called Swayam or Study Webs of Active Learning for Young Aspiring Minds, which is also an Android application. The courses in various topics along with all the information needed will be available on Swayam. Students can log on to the app and search for the courses. After finding the right course, they can enroll and all the materials along with the videos of the classes will be provided to them. Except for the small fee that students have to pay for the certificates, Swayam platform is absolutely free of cost. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. The National Digital University will enable multiple entry and exit points which will allow the students to resume their studies whenever they can. Apart from regular students, this will help the people who couldn't continue their education and the working professionals to pursue their academic aspirations and increase their employability. That's all for today. For more news and analysis, please log on to business-standard.com. We'll be back tomorrow with our next episode. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.